Thank you for tuning in to the Starkey Multifamily Podcast. I have with me Raul Patel, who's a co-founder and managing partner of Patel Gaines, fastest growing law firm in the nation. So um, Raul, thank you for joining me. Tell us a little bit about you and your history and, and your company and where you come from. Sure, thanks for having me on. Uh, first and foremost, I'm glad that we're both at home, working from home, staying safe, so appreciate that. And uh, uh, again, thanks for having me on, right? And so uh, a little bit about myself, uh, you know, been a licensed attorney for 10 plus years, time flies sometimes, we, you know, kind of think about it. Uh, started our firm about eight years ago, we, both my law partner and I work for large commercial real estate litigation firms. Um, started our firm about eight years ago, uh, and we've grown to have offices in the three major cities across Texas now, Houston, uh, North Texas, and San Antonio. So uh, we're, we're a, a young tech, tech advanced tech firm. Uh, we have a good culture, I think for, for us, culture and creativity of law firms is probably one of the hardest parts to create. You, you find yourself uh, dreading going to the lawyer's office, kind of like dreading going to the dentist's office. So we really tried, we started with the foundation of flipping that model upside down, creating a place where clients, when they're going through the best of times, and many like right now going through the worst of times, truly feel comfortable coming to us with their real scenarios. So uh, we do a lot of property tax litigation. We do about $10 billion worth of commercial property tax uh, litigation appeals annually. Uh, we do a, a, a multitude of, of uh, real estate transactions, and then we do business uh, litigation, general business litigation issues that, that happen. But um, that's a little bit about ourselves. And, and like I said, we really, we are, we're business people ourselves. We've been in real estate. So we really try to put, uh, our focus is creating, uh, giving you the best advice for you as a business owner uh, and, and balancing both the legal and the business aspects of what you have. Excellent. Well, today we're going to, we're going to focus on um, the LOI process, which I think is kind of an interesting topic because it's kind of, if, if you're new, this is the point where you're breaking into the actually doing stage. So prior to the LOI, it's just kind of a lot of, you know, education and looking around and you haven't really made a commitment. The LOI is that first stage to it becoming real. Sure. And and it's a very uh, intimidating stage, I imagine, for many people because, you know, it's real easy to study and it's really easy to say you're learning and doing all this. But the time you write that LOI, you are now putting your reputation on the line and you're now yeah. really committing. So it's a big, major step. And I think it's something to get uh, to make sure you have correct. So starting at the very basics of it, what, what is an LOI and what is the purpose of it? You know, so uh, obviously letter of intents are, are, criti are critical because they, they, you know, first of all, to touch on what you said, uh, incredibly, uh, for the first time putting an LOI and it's like, you know, your first proposal is like when you first bought your house, it's that, that rush of, hey, we did it. And then you're like, uh oh, uh, did we do this, right? And, and so I think that um, it's fantastic for those of those who've gone through this, I think they become a little bit, they understand the process for the first time you're doing an LOI. I think it's great. It's kind of, um, you know, taking the training wheels off for the first time and just seeing, seeing how you ride. And so it's your first formal letter of intent, right? So it's, it's my desire to buy your property uh, that you may have on the market or you, you know, or you may be looking to purchase. So I think it's the first kind of what I would say, you know, making it real telling you, hey, I've looked at it, I've, I've, I've test driven it, and, you know, I've checked it out, but now I'm, I'm ready to get serious. So I think the, 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 the purpose behind letter of intent is still to really show that you're serious, right? It's the first opportunity to say, look, I'm gonna be willing to put this in writing, uh, put my name and my ink on it, um, and then also give you some information about myself uh, as a buyer as to why you would wanna sell your property to me and why you feel comfortable entering into this agreement with me, right? So, um, I think that it's a great start and it's something that's usually necessary uh, for most, most organizations. Yeah, so you, you mentioned the purpose of, um, you know, kind of showing your intent, obviously a letter of intent. So I, I've also viewed it as, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as kind of a non-legal ag binding agreement that allows you to negotiate less expensive. So, um, you know, by the time you get to the PSA, Purchase Sale Agreement, you're now racking up attorney fees and, and you're getting kind of expensive 
uh, in terms of that. So I've always viewed it as a, let's hash out the details first. And when we agree on it, then we can get the legal stuff all written out. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. And I think so. I think a critical step that a lot of folks, uh, I think, shortcut sometimes is they start with a letter of intent that they come up with or have seen. I think whoever you're going to work with, whoever your real estate attorney is, you guys should come up with a letter of intent together, right? And your first letter of intent. And it doesn't need to be every single time, but maybe your template, your roadmap, things that are important to you and maybe how your investment structure is set up. Because I think that a lot of times as business folks, when I take my kind of lawyer hat off and I'm a business person, um, there are things that are important to me, right? And I say, a purchase price, how many days I have to close, uh, who pays for the appraisal, what type of extension rights I may have, you know, what kind of documents you have to provide me. I'm thinking about the things that I need in order to, to make that decision, but I'm not thinking about certain things that might come into play um, that my, my attorney is thinking. He's my CYA, right? He's covering other aspects. So what I always say, sit down together because there'll be things that he's going to then, he or she is going to try to get for you in your PSA that you may not have talk, talked about so what I say is a balancing act. One is, do you worry about the details in the LOI and say, we'll solve this later, right? And then you find yourself trying to solve that later. Or two, do you worry, do you generally outline the things that are important to you and maybe what that might look like? And then it makes the opportunity for the two attorneys to work together a lot easier. So I think that you're absolutely right. It does allow you to save some money. You don't want to have the attorney clock kind of running from the beginning before you know you can come to an agreement. But I think that it's a good way for you to at least have some opportunities thought out through. I also think letter of intents are different approaches for different folks. Some folks look at them and say, you know what, I just want to get it under contract. We'll figure out the details, all of the details later, right? Once I have it under contract, I'll figure it out. I think certain things are best hashed out in the, from business folks in the beginning, meaning if you need more time, Let's say you know you've got 30 days, but you may need 60, you may need 90. You just typically, your last three transactions, you've always needed 90. Well, then lead with that. Don't tell them 30 and then go back later on the 28th day and say, well, I need more time or I'm going to pull out. Kind of let them know and maybe you can affix a cost to that and say it's a $5,000 extension, but you know that that person feels comfortable. You, they also can mentally prepare themselves that they need, they're going to probably need 90 days. Uh, or you're going to need 90 days. And I find that everybody reacts to things differently. So it allows you to really do that. So uh, excellent point. I think you should, if you have not found your attorney, you should find that first, know who you're working with so that you're, when you transmit your LOI, they say, okay, I feel good about this. And I know how to work from that form. If that makes sense. It does. Um, and we talked a little bit before we started recording, so I'm, you kind of answered that, but I, I want to ask this question uh, and because you, you went a little bit more in detail. Yeah, we talked about you can easily get templates or talk to a friend who's maybe made offers and say, hey, can I use your LOI and then tweak it to yourself, you know, backing up when you make, if you're making the switch from single family to multifamily, you lead right with your purchase agreement. And generally, at least everyone I've ever done is right from a template. You just take the template, you fill in the price, you fill in the terms, and it's pretty boilerplate easy. Moving to LOI, if you get that from a friend who's done it before and maybe get a little advice from them, um, you know, what, what are the disadvantages of doing it that way? I would say it's, there's no real right or wrong way, right? For everybody, business is transacted differently. So I, I think that the downfall uh, or the differences between a, a residential and commercial is it's quite different. And residential for Texas, for example, you know, Texas real estate contracts are promulgated by the state of Texas. So it's not by the, by the board of realtors. So it's not hard. There's a form. There's only a certain amount of things that really come into play. So it's very, it's very regulated, if that makes sense. Now in the commercial world, it's really up to the buyer and seller uh, within reason to come up with most type of resolutions, so prorations, uh, prorations of rents, uh, how, how you know, triple nets or electric or utilities are transferred, property taxes. There's so many different nuances in there that you want to make sure you have a good understanding. Same thing with title. Um, title. Title issues can come up. How are those going to be addressed? So we had an issue, uh, for example, with one where the LOI um, had some provisions in there that didn't cover 
certain title problems that would come up and found out there's a condo regime in there for a multifamily unit that had never been taken care of. And it just, the buyer had bought it. He bought it with that in place. His title company never reviewed it and he was selling it. And he said, well, who cares? I bought it with this in place. And the issue is, well, you may have, but this is a problem, right? This is not that no one's ever brought it up in the last 15 years, but what if it comes up tomorrow, right? What if somebody brings this up tomorrow and now we have a major problem? So I think, um, you know, the, the items in an LOI are, are nice if you've got some teeth to it. Um, and it also shows the other side that you have, you've done this before, you know things are going to come up in, between the attorneys. And it actually, at the end of the day, can probably save you some time and money because there'll be some items in there that, that your attorney would want you to make sure that you've thought about, right? Um, and, and also, um, it, would just, it also shows the other side. The LOI typically sometimes can go through their business folks or their attorneys, so they know some things you might be asking. So um, no real downfall, but you may include some things accidentally or inadvertently from an LOI from somebody else that you may not want in yours, and you didn't realize the impact of that. So you, I think that's best is if you sit down with somebody you feel comfortable with and tell them how you plan on purchasing real estate. Give them your strategy, your methodology, and make sure that they kind of, what I would say, quote unquote, bless your LOI, that fits your strategy, if that makes sense. Some folks put properties under contract and figure out the financing stuff later. Like literally happens all the time. They say, I got, I'm going to get this property. And once I get it, I'm going to be able to get the down payment and I'm going to figure out the financing. Some folks have their investors and their financing basically lined up. They just got to plug in which property they're makes a big difference for an attorney who's trying to negotiate times for you and certain deadlines for you if you have a different if you have a different approach if that makes sense right so some th things to consider when you go into that also i've seen a lot of folks um especially multifamily was very very hot it's still a good market put properties under contract in their loi for an entity but that entity isn't going to be the actual purchaser of the property they just fill in the regular entity forget to put in provisions that they may assign this to something else. And we have seen of sellers that get a better offer on the table, right? $2 million, I've seen almost $3 million offer better than what was on the table with this person. And they said, no, -uh, you cannot assign it to the single purpose entity that you are creating because our contract is with you, not with this entity. And they said, it doesn't matter. That's what it's, it's, it's me. I'm it, no, nope, you are, a 10% LLC member of this LTD that you're doing, and you're the sole member of this. We made a deal with you, Starkey, not with this company. And had nothing to do with who cares? You don't, what do you care? Because they had a $3 million offer on the table, right? That was better than that deal. So we, it's, it's very, and your lender isn't gonna lend to this entity, your lender is lending to this. So lots of little things that do come up that people kind of not take for granted, but that's also why you do want somebody who's making sure that you are dotting your T or dotting your I's crossing your T's. That makes sense. It does. So that you bring up an interesting point. So being that an LOI is non-legally binding, what would prevent the seller from taking a better offer once he's agreed to an LOI? Nothing really. Right. I mean, other than how, you know, kind of what they would do. I mean, certain times there are provisions in there that could be, Hey, you know, you have this, this LOI is binding for five days upon the execution of a, P, of a PSA. So there's some stuff that you can put in there that could have some quote unquote teeth possibly. Um, but typically they are non-binding, right? So you do want to move swiftly. And I think that's why if there's certain details in there um, that are covered. Um, and then that instance I talked about went from LOI to PSA with that entity and then we'll, we'll sign it later, right? But there, by that time they had already already entered all those items and the seller became unwilling if that makes sense to assign it right mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of times we bought it it was a legal issue and we said look this is this was the dispute so it's not binding typically um but I, and i think that's probably general rules i would say you leave it that way so you don't enter into an agreement that uh one isn't enforceable and two isn't appropriate for the commercial landscape um but you do want to it'll allow you to jump to the psa a lot quicker yeah so what are um, what are some things that you see 
you, you had mentioned, you know, the assignability. What are some things you see leaved out, left out of uh, contract, or I'm sorry, left out of LOIs that you think are important? You know, title companies are something that is very important to people. Um, you know, I think, you know, depending on where you're at in Texas, this fee's regulated by the state. So it's not really a fee issue. It's a, it's a personality issue or it's a relationship uh, kind of matter. Um, so I say, I think that's really important. Some people feel very comfortable with their title company, right? They've got a relationship there. They know how to handle things. So I think title companies ironically become kind of a bit of a challenge with many folks who they want to work with. And de depending on if you're the seller or the buyer, it is important because they can help you get around certain coverages, certain issues. Um, for us, for example, we do a lot of work with First American Title and some other title companies around here. If we give them a call, pick up the phone and say, hey, look, this, this is an issue. Can you go back, figure out how you can clear this up from the title? They'll do that, but if I'm working with a title company I've never worked with, they may just go, "Sorry, we don't, we we, don't, we we're not going to remove it." And there may not be a real reason. They just don't, they just won't dig into it the way we should. So you know, title companies are important. I also think extensions are very, very critical. People are afraid to put extensions in there because they they want to show that they're serious to buy it. But let's let's be honest, if you have not figured everything out yet, tell that person to some extent and say, look, I, I not, Hey, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to buy this yet, but I'm going to figure it out. But you say, look, if I need more time, this is what I'm going to be willing to do versus waiting. And I see that come up all the time on the 28th day, we're trying to negotiate how to extend the PSA and the seller is upset because they're making some plans. And they think that they're just dragging your feet. And now it ends up becoming more costly versus from the front end, what you're going to do if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So those are some important <laughs> items as well. Um, sometimes you can also figure out who's going to run the first draft of the PSA. Um, sometimes it's just taken for granted of who's going to send the contract because it's just, well, I don't want to. Sometimes if you're, the, I always, my position is if you, whoever is listening, can control the PSA from the, from the onset, to your advantage. It doesn't matter who the buyer or the seller, try to lead with the PSA if that makes sense. Sometimes you'll be surprised. A seller might say, oh, that's great because I don't have to spend the money for a contract. I'll, you take the lead, perfect. That might be to your advantage if that makes sense. You might be surprised. And sometimes as a seller, even if it's a little more expensive, you might say, you know what, I'll, or a buyer, I, let me lead with the PSA because that way you are working from a framework that you feel comfortable with and your attorney feels comfortable with so they know where they can give and where they can push, if that makes sense, right? So um, I think that's 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 what I would are some major items I would make sure that you you kind of can cover in there as well, uh, so you can kind of get working. Do you um, do you recommend one way or the other on the on who starts with the PSA? So personally, I always try to have my attorney draft it up if if I have the choice. But um, what is your opinion on that? Whatever my client is, right? <laughs> Whoever I'm representing in that, I'd like to lead with that if it's my if I can, right? Because it's it's something that we're more comfortable with, the client's comfortable with, um, and it just saves you money, right? Because in the end, even though it costs you money to get that out, it saves you money because at the end of the day, if it's a 25 or 80 page PSA, you're going to have to have someone review it, and it's a document that that person that you've hired is typically not uncomfortable with, but just hasn't seen, you know, over you know quite a few times. So typically. Um, I always recommend people get your attorney if you can to lead that. And sometimes you'll be surprised the other side likes that because it just saves them some money and it shows that you're serious. Hey, I'll, I'll get my attorney to draft up a PSA and I'll get that over to you in the next three days, right? And so you're leading with that aggressive foot um, as a buyer or seller and either way, it puts you in the driver's seat, right? Here you go, please execute this. And you can say, well, these are my terms, right? These are some of the items that we, 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 we talked about generally in the, in the LOI already. So what, what is the discomfort, if that makes sense? Yep. Uh, I think it's really critical. A lot of folks kind of shortchange this. I think it's important to get a all hands call when you do a kickoff because you can gauge a lot between the buyer and the seller and the attorneys to figure out how we can lead this on the same flip, if that makes sense, and give your attorney as much information from the beginning. That's the thing that I think is the biggest challenge. When as an attorney, you don't have the full spectrum of information from your client and you're working under a set of, of gu guidelines, but then they're moving on you and they're going to move sometimes because of the process, but they're moving on you because the client hasn't given you the information. If that makes 
sense, right? Mm -hmm. So I always feel like, like I said, I, I, you know, we've got about a couple of clients that I know, they always like to kind of get the, at the 30th day, they're usually needing a little more time. And it's not, it just always happens because they've got a lot of process in action. So I'd rather kind of bake in into the PSA early on some extension language that allows me to get extra time based on maybe your lack of ability to provide me certain due diligence items that trigger from that day. So I wouldn't even say, look, hey, I'm not actually asking for extension of the PSA. You just didn't provide these to me until the 12th day. So I really need, you know, another 12 days because of this, right? So, and you agreed to that. So certain things that we kind of use without having to do um, extra extensions, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that brings up two, two points. Um, number one, I know in our LOI, we mentioned the due diligence doesn't start, and this is probably the most important clause in my opinion, does not start until we've received the items listed in Exhibit A. So I think that's important. And then also, um, you mentioned the, the, the extensions. So I, I may view that a little differently, so I wanna see what your thoughts are on that. So I would think not putting extensions into the contract could potentially make you look worse from the seller's point of view because it means you haven't thought about it. So in my opinion, and I wanna hear what your thoughts are, is if you put those extensions in and say, look, we're willing to put hard money down for a 30 day extension and you know, so we'll pay for it, but we wanna acknowledge that there's a chance that financing won't be done on the 60th day or you know, we won't be able to get everything done through outside circumstances. But the question is, does it make you look like you are less prepared for the, you know, the, what could happen? So if you just say, hey, we're going to close this in 30 days. You know, it kind of depends. I, mean, if, I also say that if you leave with that type of desperation, say, look, at the end of the seller, just, he has to have, he, he's adamant that we, we get past you know, due diligence in 30 days and we move to this. And you say, well, look, I'm going to lose the deal if I don't agree to that. Well, then what are you going to do at 29th day when you need more time? anyways right mm -hmm. now you're stuck with the seller that's saying no like i'm not agreeing to that and you've wasted 30 days and on top of that you know the multifamily industry just like any other is a small industry right so you don't want to get get the reputation that you put deals on a contract can't follow through or you always need more i think so to me it's a fair assessment this is look i don't we're, we're serious about this here's our timeline typical 30 days to, you know, there are in some instances we do need, I, I do need a little extra time. So if I do, this is what I'm thinking, an extra $50,000 I'll put up in earnest money or whatever that is that you feel comfortable based on the deal. But it, I think it brings some, it depends on how you do business. Some folks typically say, look, I'll deal with that at the 29th hour. Some people like to have an idea of what they're going to be dealing with at the 29th hour and know what they're in store for. Right. And so I think it's for me, if it's when I do a deal, I'd rather lay it out there from the beginning and not get the deal. Some folks like to say they like to work what I call in a little bit more of hyper panic or hyper leverage mode. We'll deal with that on 29th day. And they want more time. Let them come ask me on the 29th day at the 23rd hour. And then we'll we'll get them right. Then we'll tell them to put our earners money up. And at the same time, some people are like, look, I'm going to back out at the, after 28 days of, of kicking their tires, getting them all these documents, you know, getting them to do all this work, show me the site six times. And then I'm going to say, uh-uh, I need, actually need extra time or I need a two, uh, half a million dollar price adjustment. So to me, it's more about how you run your business versus what's right or wrong. Does that make sense? Gyms, restaurant here in Texas. They laid off all of their employees and sent them a postcard to let them know where they were laid off. So, and, and you know, there's so many ways that you do business. If, if some people may say, well, oh, well, that's the way it is. And some people may say, come on, like this, you could have, you, you could figure out a way to let them know another way. So I think that's how I look at that same approach. It's really about how you, how you view it. Me personally, I don't like calling the lawyer at the 25th hour and telling them, Hey, this is what's going on. Cause then it's, then it's a, a phone call back and forth, back and forth. And there are phone calls, telephone, that old game telephone, things get misrelayed. So you don't, me and you might be clear, right? We might be clear and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm waiting on the SBA. I'm waiting on, uh, on fan, uh, you know, Freddie Mac. I'm waiting on one LP. And I might relate that. And the other guy go, oh, I just see, I think they're just dragging their feet. Yeah, I think they're just dragging their feet. Like, 
Why did he call me on Thursday when he could have called me? And you don't know what that guy, that lawyer might be going through at four o'clock. And I call him at four o'clock just thinking, hey, this is what's happened. And he might be on his way to a soccer game. And he just thinks I'm dragging his feet. So there's so many things that telephone and I call that happen. And that's, I think that's why it's better flushed out at the beginning than it is after the fact. Yeah. So now shifting a little bit um, to, can you put too much in a LOI? So for example, we have included um, with every LOI, we'll send a, like a bio description of who's all in the deal and how we're going to structure it. Um, and that I, I've had people tell me it's too much, but I, that I think is essential, especially for somebody who has less experience and has less look at what I've done, but at least here's my reputation and here's what I've done, et cetera. So I guess with that part, and then we're also talking about adding in even some assumptions that we've made on financing, you know, our plan for, you know, what, what assumptions have we made on our expenses, you know? So yeah, you, you may be able to run it at 30% expense ratio, but this is not, that's not where we're at. So we've got our insurance is going to be this, our um, taxes are going to go to this. Here's what we've assumed on taxes. Here's what we've assumed on payroll. Uh, do you think that's too far? Like, where is the line to draw? So answer you two questions. Number one, I think your resume and bio are very important, right? And so to me, I prefer, I kind of told you about, it's about how you, how you conduct business. I think it's important if your reputation and your resume are, are well put together and have a good record, I think it's important, right? You'd rather do business with somebody that you can trust. And that's why I always say it's better to be honest and lose the deal than to be dishonest, gain the deal, and then be stuck. So I think, um, you know, if you have a solid reputation, you have people that are good financial partners, or LPs, or deals you've done in the past, I think it gives people confidence, right? It's like much like anything else. If you have a walk in and your credit score is written across your chest when you go to buy a car, right, and your income is below it, guarantee you, depending on what that says, the salesmen are going to run towards you, right? Or, and so I think um, it's very much the same. If you lead with that foot, brokers, small community, they know each other and say, oh, yeah, Starkey, Patel, those guys are, those guys are real good. Like when they say um, they're going to get through, they may take a few extra days here and there, but they're, they're, their lawyers are easy to work with. Their, their team's really pretty good. Um, and um, they're, they're honest, right? Um, so I think, you know, those types of things are important because I think you do look at, you do look at the buyer, right? And you do look at the seller. I think, I think it is, I think it is important regardless of what position you're sitting in, because if, as a buyer, you also want to know your seller too, right? If they have a, they have a really good reputation to work with you, it's easier for the lawyer to say, you know what, we can't agree on this provision, but it's okay. Like I, I, I know that I know them. I've, I've seen their transactions. I've seen their deals. So if I call the lawyer, Prior to closing, I'm sure we'll work it out. Now, some you can say, look, if we don't get this figured out now, there won't be a figuring out later. If that makes sense, right? So reputation does mean a lot. You know, doing this for 10 years, there are lawyers, if they shoot me an email and tell me something, I got zero question that they're telling me the truth. Right? I know it. Like if they're telling me, hey man, my client's at X, if you could think you're at this, it's probably a deal. If not, this seems like a breaking point for them. I know that they're not negotiating with me they're telling me the truth and there are those that i you, you just don't even know where the truth is because that's who they are so you you and i relate that back to my client look i don't know this is what they're showing i've seen they, now it's a cat and mouse bluff game so i think your reputation is really important and if you have a strong bio resume you should think of that um i think your second question was about you know how much information do you put in your your, your term your loi I think it's a balancing act. You don't want to give them your entire recipe and, and your formula. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of people do put financial feasibilities and certain triggers in there, right? To say, look, you know, I'm going to need a financial feasibility uh, provision that hits certain ratio. Um, and, and that's what my lender and my partners require. Um, and if I, if, once I see your due diligence documents, I should be, I should be fine. We made certain assumptions. So I think that that's, that's a good way to make sure that the buyer is all or the seller says, okay, what I put out there is the truth too. Cause a lot of times you put 6% cap rate, right? They, the broker's got information out there and then you come in there and you're like, what? This isn't, this isn't even close, right? looks like they haven't done any maintenance in, in six years. So no wonder they have a super low expense rate, right? So certain things that I think 
you can put in there because if you're going to, if those are going to be your breaking points, it's probably important anyways, right? Because you're going to back out of the deal. Um, if you think the buy the seller is going to balk at that or create issues with that because they say, look, I don't care how, you, how much money you're going to make on it. This is the information. Then you may not, it may be a provision you strike out of your LOI and you deal with it later. Um, or you do it with it during the due diligence phase of it, right? But I think that is not a bad idea. Um, I wouldn't put much in there about your investors and how you're going to invest, how you're going to, how you're going to fund the deal. Um, but I think you know financing contingency is is very important, and you might want to take that one step further, you know, contingent on getting financing, plus hitting some basic thresholds and ratios. If that makes sense. So, so you said to clarify, um, if you plan to syndicate it, you would not recommend putting that in the LOI? Yeah, I don't think, you know, it, de it depends. You know, if you have a strong syndicate record, if you've got a, 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 a path, I, I don't think as long as you've got, I like the assignment provision, because you may change up the deal structure, you know, so I don't know if that's necessary, if I had to tell them that how you're going to do that as long as you, you know, you've got enough time and you've got comfort on the back end to do that. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think the seller really cares how you do that nature of it. But I think what you talked about more or less is I need to hit certain merit, uh, metrics before this is becomes the deal that I struck with you, right? I've agreed to pay 10 million making certain assumptions. We did not put that in the actual LOI, but kind of like an LOI package, you know? Yep. So it's like, here's the attachment of our bios. Here's the attachment of some assumptions just to know where we came from. And, and the reason we came up with that is some brokers uh, will send you a questionnaire before going, before accepting an LOI. Yeah. Of which a lot of those questions are in there. What are some of your expense assumptions? What are your rent assumptions? What are, you know, what's financing? Are you syndicating or buying yourself? So that's kind of why we, we thought, well, if that's important for them to know, why not just put it in there and say, hey, here's what we're, where we're coming from and, and just kind of let them make the decision. Like you said, so there's no surprises later. Right. And those are, so those are sophisticated sellers, right? Sophisticated brokers, sophisticated folks that, that kind of want to know more about you before they just line up. Um, there's, you know, multifamily has been hot. A lot of folks really just jumping into multifamily that have never done multifamily before. Um, they're putting deals under contract that they can't close. Um, so I think a lot of that product is with sellers who are more patient in the market and are saying, look, I want to make, I want, I want to sell it, but I want to sell it to the right person and the person that I can deal with. And I know that will can close and has a level of sophistication. And I think that's probably why you see a lot of that from certain people and certain folks just say price down payment, earnest money, good to go. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, you know, that's a lot about uh, a lot of that, I think, in my opinion, um, but I think it's great. And especially if they don't ask for it, if you lead with it, it shows the seller, if they're looking at two packages, you might want to say, this one's 10 million, this was 10.6, but the $10 million guy is going to close. Like, look at his track record, look at his ability. It's not the highest price because this 10.6, he can't close. And it happens all of the time where we have seen not the highest bid necessarily gets it. It's the person that says, look, this person will actually deliver for me, not at this price versus this person who's going to put it under contract for 10.6 and then renegotiate with me 30 days into this thing. And it's going to be 9.2 and you may or may not close. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the, that's important too, because I think you, you'll never know which broker you'll be up again, up against or with next time. So if that's your strategy, they're going to know it. And then guess what? They're going to tell it, even if it's not true or it's only happened once, they're gonna tell that. So you're better off being honest, in my opinion, from the jump than it is kind of redoing deals. But some folks, they do it all the time and they're super successful with it. So I can't say that it's a fault to them, it's just how they, how, how they may operate, right? So what about, um, so you had talked about, you know, depends, this, uh, that sounded like a sophisticated seller or sophisticated broker. So would you recommend different types of LOIs for, maybe an off market dealing direct with a seller or dealing with a sophisticated broker or maybe kind of a, you know, like a, a realtor that just happened to get a commercial deal. Uh, that's a tough one because there's no one, there's no one recipe. You know, I've seen uh, when I say, you know, you could be the answer to sophistication is very different. You could be, you could have one property and have never sold a property. You know, you bought it 20 years ago and been running it. 
and you could be just as sophisticated as somebody who's done 11 deals, if that makes sense. So um, the answer to that sophistication is not clear based on who you're working with, but I think that, you know, you can work towards that LOI based on the relationship that you start to see with your buyer, the seller, or the broker, right? So that's mm -hmm. why I think folks like you who, who've done deals before, um, have some general understanding, have talked to other people in the industry, you know, we kind of get a sense of what the broker's thinking about the other broker, about the seller, what things are important to them, learning that, right? You know, it's just like when you go buy a house, you know that sometimes it's really important to know, hey, look, they've already bought another house, they've already moved in, and they got two mortgages, and school starts in August, so they got to sell this one, so you kind of know what's important. Closing in 30 days is more important than maybe the extra $20,000, right? Mm -hmm. Only because four more mortgage payments later, they're right back to square one. Yeah. Or, you know what? This house is paid off, and so is this, and they've moved, and so they don't really care. So there's so many things that are important about to get to learn about that person to understand, hey, what is driving your decision? And then giving them what is making them feel comfortable about what their selling points are or what their buying points are right so i always feel like learn about that and then feed that greater because that that will make that will help you accomplish your deal right get them feeling more and more comfortable about uh their 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 habits and instead of adjusting around yours try to adjust around their habits and that will allow you to better better kind of get through the deal yeah i think that's that's great advice on really anything is to cater your offer, whether it be offering a job for an employee to work for you or buying a single family or buying a multifamily is really knowing, uh, you know, what, what's driving them. So on multifamily, I mean, they could be doing a 1031 exchange, which means your credibility to close is top priority. You know, they could be doing, you know, maybe their, their, their financing balloon is running up or, you know, they're, they've got a window that they've got to sell this in. So there's a lot of things that could be driving that. And, and to know that or to make an LOI without knowing that and without catering to their needs is probably quite ignorant. Right. So I think that's, that's the key, really learning. And the more you learn, the more they share with you, you know, you just kind of realize you can try to, you know, build around that's, hey, look, okay, I get it. This is really important to you. So here's what we're going to do, right? So there's lots of ways you can work with them uh, if that makes sense. So yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, what else, is there anything on the LOI process that, that we didn't discuss that, that we've left out somehow? No, you know, I think, I think my general rules are is really before you do it, it's, it's usually a one or two page doc, right? So it's not a lot. Uh, somebody you work with and you've got a good relationship with. Typically, it's a five, 10 minute review. Um, but most of the time, your attorneys don't even, you know, good attorneys with that you work with all the time don't even charge you for the review of that before it goes out. You know, just, just make sure that what you're getting out there has been blessed by somebody that you're going to be working with from the beginning, from, just from a general starting point standpoint. Then you may tweak a little bit. Um, but you don't, uh, you know, a lot of times I would say is involve the person you're going to be working with a little bit on the front end. So it just saves you a lot of time on the back end, right? And so you're not you're you're not forgetting something that might be state specific or deal specific. Uh, and then the second thing in your LOI, when you get your LOI, I think that it's very very important for of your you as a client to send, when you transmit your LOI to your attorney, transmit your LOI and get on the phone or email them all of the other items that are either important to you or not important to you or moderate to you and give them some go from the beginning. Say, look, I put this title company in there, but I don't really care, right? If you can get it to be this title company, do it, but if it's a giveaway, make it a giveaway. I'm not moving on purchase price, I'm not moving on extension, I'm not moving on XYZ, on these three or four other things, I don't really care as much. I'll pay for the survey, I'll do these. So kind of give that person some, new, some early tools so you're not, hold on, let me see what, it, yeah. Going back and forth rather than I like to be able to say, you know what, no worries. How about if I'm negotiating with you on the PSA? Look, you know what, Starkey, I'll give you these three things. I think I can get my client to agree on this. I think I can get my client to agree on this. I got no problem over here, but on these three things, you got to work with me if I, you know, if I can move on these. So you're kind of getting some pre-items pre in my mind rather than everything I got to go back to it. Lose, your attorney loses the ability to actually help control the deal versus just being the messenger. So I think that's what helps a lot of times is being able to let the other person know. You say, hey, you know what? My client will be okay with this. What I don't wanna do is call you and then go, no, I'm not good with that. 
then I got to call that guy back up and then he doesn't have any credibility. Rather, I got to know Stark is good with a 30 day extension. If it, if they put some more money up, earnest money up hard, I can offer that up from the jump and say, look, I'm cool with it. You got to put something up front. How about 20,000 called? I know, I know my client will be comfortable with that. Go ahead and do that. Now I've got credibility and I also have my client knowing that I've got comfort being able to say something. Does that make sense? Yeah, total. Yeah, total sense. And I think another thing which uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about, but just to rehash it, you know, having all that stuff up front, I think is a big difference between somebody who gets a reputation of being some a retrader or someone who gets a reputation of being a closer. And and like you mentioned earlier, you may not get that deal under contract, but all the ones that you did, you closed. Um, and, and that's a good thing. So, uh, you know, because that, that example you gave with the 10 and the $10.6 million offers, if that 10.6 becomes 9.2 and you know that you passed on a $10 million deal, that's going to sour your, your reputation for that broker forever. And probably when he talks about you at, uh, you know, the other conferences that he goes to, so are the other brokers in the area are going to know you. I agree. And, and you are right. It's a very small world. Everybody knows who you are. Absolutely. <laughs> with a good reputation because you'll you'll be surprised after a few deals you'll get more deal you'll save yourself a lot of money in fact you'll probably be able to put co properties under contract for less than your your competitor for and lots of i mean hundreds of thousands of dollars we've seen clients get deals for a million plus lower than the other person simply because the reputation of their team and their attorney legal team was you know what these guys will get you done and so if I'm looking at two offers and sometimes 36 million and 34.2 and you go, well, duh, not really. Because at the end of the day, like I don't have 90 days to mess around. And I know that this guy at 34 is a done deal. And this one at 36.2 is not. Mm -hmm. So I would take this and we've seen it numerous times where we've gotten the clients been able to get a deal where the, somebody had a higher offer and it doesn't mean anything, right? You can make whatever offer you want, but so uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not just your reputation, it's the reputation of the broker that you're putting on the line. Yeah, absolutely. So if they say, hey, I want you to take this, this deal from Raul, you know, and then, and then if, if that person does or doesn't come through, that affects their reputation. And it, it's not, you know, it, it, he'll remember that. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Cool. So, so uh, Raul, uh, how would somebody reach out to you if they wanted to get a hold of you? Uh, you can get a hold of us on our website, www.patelgains, P-A-T-E-L-G-A-I-N-E-S.com. Um, you can also email us at info at patelgains.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, and you can always give us a call, um, but all our information is on our website. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I think it was uh, very valuable, and uh, I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Thank you.